Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I apologize that uh, in, spite, in spite of the fact my last name sounds Spanish, I don't speak Spanish. I'm only Italian. I do understand a bit of Spanish, uh, but I will prefer to speak in English. So hopefully um, you can follow me even if I speak English. So um, we're all here to uh, confront a important uh, and puzzling fact. Chile is coming out of 30 years of uh, phenomenal uh, economic success. Uh, income per capita has grown a lot. Uh, education has grown a lot. Uh, poverty has dropped dramatically. And even inequality has dropped in spite of the fact that in the rest of the world, uh, we have seen a trend in the opposite direction. So if all of this it was happening, why did we see so much social unrest? Why did, did we see so violent riots? And while we never want to forgive violence, we cannot ignore the rage that is fueling that violence. We cannot ignore the fact that uh, behind that rage, there is a problem, and that problem needs to be addressed if we want this growth of Chile to continue uh, in the future. Now, in order to try to explain this, let me start with an example. Now, my kids have grown up, but when they were small, I have a boy and a girl, they used to play Monopoly together. And uh, inevitably, after a few uh, minutes that they were playing, uh, they will start fighting, and uh, my daughter, who is a little bit younger, will start crying. So I will try to intervene, try to figure out what was happening. And uh, my daughter will accuse my son of cheating. My son, with the rules in his hands, will say, absolutely not, I follow the rules. And my understanding, uh, my son still disputes this interpretation, but my understanding is that because at the time my son could read perfectly and my daughter was younger not, uh, my son knew the rules, could read them, and selectively enforced them. And my daughter, who is not a fool, uh, could not pinpoint what is wrong, but understood a fundamental point that the game was rigged. And so she did the only thing she could do if the, she feels that the game is rigged, that is, cry and leave the game. And I feel this is what is happening in Chile right now. And uh, this is a very common situation. In Italy, every time there is a soccer match and one loses, they start to accuse the referee and they say, Abito vendido, ladron. And most of the time, it's just a childish uh, expression of rage. But if you start to question the impartiality of the referee, like uh, in Italy often do, because many of them are not uh, impartial, then uh, that rage transforms into a movement, transforms into violence, transforms into a riot. And so uh, what I'm telling you is the reason why, in spite of all the great success of the Chilean economy, the reason why uh, a lot of people felt the need to express their protest, a bit like my daughter felt, is because they feel that the Chilean economy is rigged, and I fear that this is not just a misperception. There is a lot of uh, reality in this. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is that uh, what I told a bunch of uh, Chilean MBAs who came to Chicago two years ago, and I said, actually, I think that uh, the Chilean economy looks very much like uh, a chronic capitalist uh, country. And, uh, and if you don't know the term of uh, chronic capitalism in Spanish, you have a much better term, which is capitalismo de amigotes. And uh, in fact, being Chile, I would say capitalismo de yernos. Uh, but uh, I think that the idea is, is the same. And uh, back then, not only the students, but uh, was present the former finance minister Rodrigo Valdez, would say, how could you dare calling Chile a chronic capitalist country when we have the best statistics of Latin America and one of the best in the world? We are first for enforcement of law, uh, lack of corruption, and all those lists. And I said, I think that uh, you guys are missing the point. 
I'm not saying that uh, Chile is not a capitalist country. It's certainly a capitalist country, but he's adopting a type of capitalist that does not seem to actually produce benefits for everybody. And uh, capital is not all the same. There are very different type, types of capitalism. And if you don't understand them, I think that uh, you might end up uh, uh, in trouble. And so I said, look, uh, at the very minimum, let's distinguish between what I can say a conservative capitalism and a popular capitalism. So a conservative capitalist emphasizes mostly uh, the importance of protection of property rights. Now, it's very important to protect your property rights in any form of capitalism. However, sometimes there is too much of a good thing. Is it possible there is too much of a protection of property rights? Think for a second, if the inventor of the alphabet or its descendants had a right on every letter we use, and we had to pay a royalty for every letter, Every war that was invented had a right that we have to pay. Our freedom of expression will be limited. Our ability to communicate will be limited. And certainly will be protection of property rights. But that will not work particularly well. So there is another system of capitalists that I call competitive capitalists or popular capitalists. Why? Because I think that competition is the essence that makes capitalism work for everybody. If you look at the word economic competition in the English dictionary, they say it is the effort of one or, or two or multiple parties acting independently, and I stress independently, to secure the business of a third party by offering the most profitable, the most advantageous terms. So it is only the competition, independent action of various players that will ensure that consumers have the lowest price possible. And there is plenty of research documenting that, uh, but I have my own showing that in countries where the rules of competition in the mobile sector are better, you have lower prices for mobile phones and no higher uh, and no lower quality. So competition is better for consumers. And uh, I came here from the airport to a fantastic uh, highway and every so often there was a beep. And I asked the driver, what is the beep? And the beep is the meter that pays how much you pay on the highway. And I said, okay, tell me how much you pay to go to, uh, from uh, uh, the airport to downtown. And he said, $10. I said, tell me what is the minimum income that people make? $400. Say, that doesn't sound right. The price of the highway is too high. Why? It's a monopoly. Okay? It's a monopoly. There is no competition. The prices are not the best they can be for consumers. But also, competition reduces inequality. In 2015, the richest man on earth was actually Carlos Slim. In 2015, he lost 30 billion of his wealth. Now, don't cry for him because he has 30 billion left, so he's not exactly poor. Why did he lose 30 billion? Because they started to introduce competition in the Mexican fixed line and mobile uh, phone market. And that made all the difference in the world. So competition is what reduces inequality. Competition also is what uh, reduces the negative effect of discrimination and racism. This is an idea that uh, uh, late Gary Becker from Chicago has pioneered, but this is an idea that has been proven right over and over again. And in fact, I discover that Chicago applied this rule even before Gary Becker thought about it. Because Chicago was created in 1892, was a late camel among the big universities. And in order to catch up with a big university of the East, they said, we need to look for the best teachers that are discriminated by the other universities. And at the time, who was discriminated were the Jewish people. And so the University of Chicago on purpose hired basically all Jewish faculty in order to catch up to the rest of the university. So competition is what reduces 
uh, uh, discrimination, uh, both in terms of race, gender, religion, and so on and so forth. But I want to tell you something that people don't emphasize enough. Competition is what makes people free. Because competition means that I don't lose much. In fact, in the limit, I don't lose anything from going to my next best alternative to choose somebody else. So competition destroy the power of the people above you. And let me give you another example from the University of Chicago. Many years ago, there was a young assistant professor and who are walking toward the faculty lounge and was raining. And an old fart, somebody much older than me, uh, that uh, is European said, you know, young fellow, if you were in Europe, you will carry the umbrella for me. And the young assistant professor said, X, I will not repeat the name, why don't you go to Europe? And why did he have the strength to do so? He had the strength to do so because this guy was highly sought in the market. He could go to Stanford, Harvard, uh, Yale, any time of the day. And so there was no power on the person above him. If you are concerned about sexual harassment, sexual harassment is about power more than it's about sex. And it comes only in situations where your superior has power over you. In a world of competition, there is no room for that. And so what is the problem is Chile is doing phenomenally well on the first metric of capitalism in protecting property rights and making sure that the rule of law is followed. It's not doing as well in the second dimension. In fact, somebody said that uh, uh, Chile is not an economy, it's a country club. And uh, now, this is not a new problem. Adam Smith himself, it said, uh, men of the same trade, the at, the, at that time were all men, men of the same trade, they seldom get together, even for merriment or diversion, but the conversation drift into a conspiracy against the public on some method to raise prices. So this is not a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that Adam Smith understood very well. The question is, what do you do about it? Okay? Because Adam Smith was the first one to say, we can't really break these things apart with the law. Because at least law we want to live with is because we cannot prohibit people to get together for marriages or parties or other events. And if every time they get together, they conspire, what can we do about it? And the answer, we can do a lot. So uh, I think that U US economy did face a problem like this in the early part of the 20th century. And through a series of reforms, changed the system quite dramatically. And uh, what are those reforms? The first one, which is actually extremely simple, is to make difficult to concentrate a lot of economic power by taxing appropriately conglomerates. Today, in the United States, if I own a corporation that own a corporation that own a corporation, every round I pay 22% of taxes on my profits. And so if I have a long pyramid, by the end of a long pyramid, my profits go to zero because the government gets a cut at every stage. In Chile, and it's a consolation, Chile is not unique in that dimension. A lot of countries do that. But in Chile, conglomerates are subsidized. Why? Because I get a tax credit for the taxes I pay at the lower level. And so every time the things go up, I don't lose anything. And as a result, very few people, through conglomerates and leverage, they can assemble a huge amount of power. And so the chances that in the same room you have people conspiring is maximized. So rule number one, actually tax people the proper way. And that will change the system. And this was tried by Roosevelt in, in America and worked extremely well. 
There were a lot of pyramids that control all the public utilities. They are gone. The second thing, always about taxes, is what about a serious inheritance tax? If we want to break down excessive concentration, we sort of should have serious taxes at death. And once, it was the last one, I was interviewed by Fox News, and they say, what do you think about the inheritance tax? That in the United States is called death tax, to make it sound like uh, uh, a terrible thing. And I said, as economists, we know that you have to tax things that you cannot avoid, because the more uh, elastic is your response to the tax, the bigger is the welfare cost of the tax. And I said, if there is one thing we know we cannot avoid, it's death. So the death tax me makes a lot of sense. I was never invited by Fox News anymore. But that is the point. I think the death tax is effective. And in fact, I have this little uh, test that if people don't scream, then it means that the proposal is not effective. So when you make a proposal, you start here, a lot of people screaming, then you know that the proposal is working. If they don't scream, if they accept it too easily, means that it's not working. Now, number three, you, I know you have a serious antitrust authority that is trying to uh, expose all the level of collusions that exist in this country. And I know that so far, uh, penalties were very small. In fact, uh, most uh, managers got away with uh, no penalty. I also know that finally you have introduced some real sanction. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, I learned recently, in the United States, uh, the notion of white collar criminal was introduced only in the mid 40s. Because up to that point, they thought that criminal was only somebody violent that looked very different than somebody with a suit. So the idea of white collar criminal was a oxymoron, a contradiction. And the first time somebody was caught price fixing from GE, uh, they actually were celebrated by all their business partners as heroes. They sacrificed for the business interest. Now things have changed. And uh, you need a change in norms. But also, how to be more effective? Again, you can use competition. How do you do it? You reward whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are people that report information about a collusion case produce enough evidence that leads to, to uh, 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 conviction. And then it's very easy. You either, either you basically g give a free pass to the first firm in a cartel that reports. And I don't know if you ever heard about this uh, game called Priscilla Dilemma. It's exactly a race of who talks first. And so by giving a free pass to the first company that reports information sufficient to convict all the other ones is a rush to the door of the prosecutor. And then if that's not enough, because in, in a place where all the firms are uh, related by blood or marriage, maybe that doesn't work, collusion is stronger than competition, then you make sure that you pay an employee that reports. If I'm an employee and I report a case of collusion, I get a fraction of the money that the government gets as a reward. Again, if you think that this is a socialist tactic was invented by Abraham Lincoln in America and now is super spread in, in the United States and works. Works so much that executives are terrified because it works too well. In fact, it was introduced in the United States in 2010 by the Dodd-Frank against corporate fraud. And now there is a pressure to try to reduce the reward that is given to whistleblowers because the corporate executives are afraid of what is happening. So I think that these kind of reforms are necessary to make capitalism work for everyone. And it's not only to work for everyone, but also to have the political consensus that it deserves. 
It's only a competitive capitalist that offers benefits to everyone and empower the people against the concentrated power that has the chance of not only living, but thriving in a democracy. And I think this is what Chile should now do. This is what Chile should fight for. Thank you.